Good afternoon and welcome to our speaker series event. My name is Vaktan Putkaradze and I'm the Vice President Transformation Science and Technology for ATCO and I'll be your moderator today. I would like to start by welcoming Nancy Southern, Chair and CEO at ATCO, who has some welcoming remarks and will introduce our speaker. Nancy, in her leadership position at ATCO, has long played a leading role in understanding the most efficient and safe operating procedures for our business. Weather plays the crucial part in our operations, and therefore the topic of this lecture is of particular importance to Nancy interests, as well as ATCO's goals. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll turn things over to you. Well, thank you very, very much, Vaktang. It is indeed a great pleasure to warmly welcome my ATCO colleagues, friends from academia and commerce, and the community at large, who are joining us today for the fifth installment of the ATCO Space Lab speaker series. Let me begin by saying I am honored to live and work in Treaty 7, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Comprised of the Siksika, Kainai, Pikani First Nations, the Tsutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Wherever you're joining us from today, let's take a moment to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land you're on today. And let's all pay our respects to elders past and present in the communities where we live and work. Now our Space Lab speaker series are brought to us by ATCO's transformation team, the group that fosters and encourages our critical thinking as individuals, teams and indeed as an entire organization. Critical thinking is exemplified through open mindedness and awareness of the scientific themes, trends and issues that can powerfully impact the world around us as we each strive to play a more informed role in how we work and live. Through our speaker series, we're fortunate to have the world's most knowledgeable and thought provoking experts to guide us. And today is no exception. Our topic, extreme weather, with our world renowned keynote speaker, Dr. Valerio Lucarini, is going to be exceptional. And I'm truly excited about today's lecture. Weather is far more than a topic of social conversation or a question of being adequately dressed for the day. I know that for ATCO's operations, being prepared for extreme weather is non-negotiable in order to keep lights on, homes warm and critical facilities running. The operations of our essential services requires us to understand, predict and prepare for extreme weather. For example, ATCO Electricity Division is expected to safely deliver reliable power over about 85,000 kilometers of transmission and distribution lines to 45 communities across the province of Alberta, regardless of the weather. And, and we all know and can appreciate how critical reliable heat is when the temperatures are minus 10 to minus 50 below here in Alberta. At Cofrontex most must always be prepared to maintain their military support services in some of the world's most punishing environments from Canada's extreme north to the mountainous terrains of Afghanistan. Weather data helps us plan, prepare, and ultimately maintain critical operations in places where the consequences of not being prepared could result in untenable safety circumstances, like the one in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico found itself after hurricanes Irma and Maria in a devastating position with many lost lives. And ATCO's new company, Luma, is now in the process of an entire rebuild of Puerto Rico's electric grid. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to conceptualize and deliver a resilient, reliable grid without a deep scientific understanding of the annual Hurricane Susan that 
season that occurs in the, in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. So for me, as I'm sure for all of you, a greater understanding of weather and its predictability is dearly welcomed, and there is no one more informed, practiced, or recognized for their tireless work on climate than Dr. Valerio Lucarini. From the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the UK's University of Reading, where he is Professor of Statistical Mechanics and a Director for the Center for Mathematics of Planet Earth, Dr. Lucarini is also affiliated with the Walker Institute at the University of Reading, the Center for Earth System Research and Sustainability, the Institute of Meteorology at the University of Hamburg, and the Center for Environmental Policy at the Imperial College of London. Dr. Lucarini's expertise and passion is analyzing extreme weather events. He's developed and delivered numerous contributions to climate and weather science through climate predictions in global models, research about the instabilities of climate, and even an exploration of the potential reversibility of climate change. Professor Lucarini's work has been recognized with many international awards. And just to name the most recent ones, he was awarded the 2020 Louis Fry Richardson Medal from the European Geophysics Union for outstanding contributions to the extreme value theory and climate science in general, with particular applications to climate modeling and prediction. Although I'm sure Dr. Lucarini will share with you his thoughts with me on predictability. Now in 2018, he was awarded the Whitehead Prize from the London Mathematical Society for his work applying the ideas and methods of statistical physics to the theory and modeling of climate dynamics and for his leadership in the field of mathematics applied to climate science. Dr. Lucarini, it is indeed a tremendous honor for me, the people of ATCO, the community that is joining us today, and your colleagues from academia. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your lecture. I'll turn it back to Vakhtang now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nancy, thank you, Nancy for, for, for great introduction to the speaker and this lecture. Again, welcome all of you who have joined us. This lecture, as Nancy mentioned, will be the fifth lecture in the ATCA speaker series. Um, and uh, the goal of this uh, series, also as Nancy has mentioned, is to provide ATCA's workforce and other listeners with the information on the most promising developments in the relevant fields, outline where the state of the art is now and who are the leading experts are in these fields and what is possible to achieve within 10 to 15 years horizon. Before we get underway with today's lecture, I would also like to remind you that this session is a one way video and audio format. You can see and hear the presenters, but they can't hear you, um, which is not the greatest for audience feedback. So that's why we're encouraging you to ask questions. You can do so by using the question icon in the right on your screen. We will open up question functionality roughly midway through Professor Lucarini's lecture. Um, you can uh, address your questions to him, uh, and then we will have a moderated um, quick Q&A session right after his lecture. With that, I would like to pass the microphone to Professor Lucarini. Um, great to have you with us, Valero. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, so uh, hello everyone. It's a huge pleasure and uh, a great honor to contribute to this uh, seminar series. Uh, thanks for hosting me and thanks for the warm uh, hospitality and really nice work by everyone. And uh, so today um, I will try uh, to um, uh, give you a sense of some possibly interesting aspects associated with the understanding and the prediction of extreme events in the climate system. And uh, of course, I'm broadcasting from somewhere over the rainbow and more specifically, in fact, I'm in central London and uh, there are many people I've been working with uh, and that have contributed to these uh, results and these ideas. And in particular here, 
I need to remind uh, Marco Cucchi, David De Faranda, Vera Medinda Galfi, Tobias Cuna, Francesco Ragone and Nierun Voters. And as you will see, a special guest of this presentation will be Quentin Tarantino. So uh, why do we want to, to, to study extremes? So there are many good reasons to study extremes. You can have a fetish for extremes. You can be interested in the fact that extremes um, have caused uh, enormous uh, damage to our environmental as well and social welfare and uh, in the form of uh, um, damages uh, uh, to ecosystem, society and economy. And the numbers are astounding, of course. And uh, of course, when we think about, uh, there are many aspects of weather variability that cause damages, but extremes have the lion's share on that. There is another aspect is, is that extremes, as we, we, I will try to convince you, provide us some sort of uh, very special way to look at the fundamental properties of the systems we want to study. They act like a map. So let me give you something that is commonly used, especially in, uh, the, con in the say United Nations kind of context and in the, when people talk about natural hazards. So people talk about slow onset, fast onset, and fast onset uh, natural hazards. Slow onset uh, natural hazards are those that have a long time scales. And in particular, drought is a typical example of a slow onset uh, natural hazard. When we talk about fast onset natural hazard, that's clear, we instead uh, uh, describe events that have a short time scale. And the, let's say the most obvious one could be a flash flood. And then there is something interesting already occurring here. Events like a cold spell or a heat wave are usually classified as a slow onset events because they last a long time. But in fact, I'm criticizing this classification for the following reason, because indeed, say a heat wave or a cold spell has a long persistence, but on the other side, the, on the onset and the decay can be very fast. So these are events where the so-called multi-scale nature of climate appears. And this tells us that this uh, phenomena are very complex and very hard to predict. So when we talk about an extreme, what is in fact an extreme? So usually we mix up our sort of everyday language with some technical language. So when we talk about extremes, we think about something that's very rare or we think something that's very large in some sense, or we think uh, about something which has a very high impact on an as uh, on, on, on uh, some uh, element of society, of the environment we care for. And uh, so these definitions indeed have, of course, some good overlap, but they're not the same thing. And so different points of view can be needed to study different problems. So now it's time to start. And I want to jump into this topic. So it's time to dance, as Maya suggests us. So Maya Wall, let's go on from Maya Wallace from uh, Pulp Fiction. And let's try, let's start instead with the boring viewpoint on extreme. So what is how do we usually define extremes? And in fact, uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of our intuition will uh, indicate, suggest us to go. And, uh, so, you know, we, we have we look at a variable, say temperature, we define somehow loosely what we define as normal. It's a normal temperature outside. And then we, def we, de we decide that something that's above normal would be extremely hot and uh, something that's below normal will be extremely cold. So when we do this operation and uh, uh, this operation relies on a lot of hidden assumption and subjective choices, like we assume how the, this, what is, how the, temperature is usually distributed and also we set more or less arbitrarily some sort of thresholds. So whereas this is attractive because it's simple, it creates us a lot of problems. And but you, you might think that this is a sort of uh, uh, just um, layman way to look at things. In fact, even if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, which is uh, the interna inter uh, international body devoted to studying and collecting uh, uh, the most recent literature on climate and provide information for stakeholders and policymakers, actually the definition that's used for extremes is not very different from what I have uh, described to you. And these prescriptions are sort of normative uh, and useful rather than being in some sense rigorous. Doesn't mean they're not useful, they are useful, but there are issues with this way. 
And as an example, when people uh, talk about what is the impact of climate change on, say, temperature, uh, it is attractive to say the following. Well, let's say the mean of the temperature will uh, change, in particular increase, and then uh, how broad this distribution, what is called usually the variance of the distribution, will change. So by combining how much the, uh, on the average the temperature will change and how, how the fluctuations of the temperature will change, I derive my conclusion on how, how the tail of the distribution, say on the right the hot tail or the cold tail on the left hand side of this distribution, will change. So again, uh, this is uh, there are a lot of mathematical assumption here, but these pictures are easy to see and easy to read, so they become attractive. So the intuition says, OK, I will follow this. I will stick to this sort of image because this is an image that I can easily fix in my mind. But as Myers Wallace's husband, the uh, notorious Marcellus Wallace says, I mean, I'm actually not uh, quoting, but adapting from uh, Pulp Fiction, common sense always This already indicates that we have to believe, be uh, careful about always believing in the power of machine learning. Machine learning is a wonderful in, uh, set of tools, methods, ideas to, see, in some sense, be able to reproduce what happens usually in a system. If we're going to look at true extremes, the usual will not necessarily matter more. So we have to understand something more before using an all encompassing tool. So let's go back to the relationship between climate change and extremes. So for long until very recently, we have all been talking about climate change, but recently some media outlets and later on more, a growing number of scientists have decided not to talk anymore about climate change, but about climate crisis. What is the reason behind the use of this expression? The idea is where a climate crisis wants to convey the image, the, the, let's say the concept, which is actually very correct, that climate change will not just manifest, manifest itself as a change in the average properties of the climate, but also in the change of what is called the higher moments of its distribution, that is in extreme events. And because the change on this, on the properties, on the statistics and the nature of extreme events will be the thing that will impact us the most. So just to give you an example of how this is percolating, now if you look at uh, just uh, the part of the website of the Met Office, the UK Met Office dedicated to, let's say, the interaction with the, uh, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with, the um, with the general public, and you look at uh, how uh, climate change is described, I found recently this very interesting uh, piece of information that they're not just telling uh, OK, in 50 years, the temperature will increase by two, three degrees. This is in some sense boring. Of course, it's correct. But they are using a different way to give a sense of what climate change will mean, a change climate will mean. So as an example, it said the probability of heat waves will increase by a factor of 30. So this is a much better way to understand the impact of climate change, so by describing the change in the number and nature of extremes. Another aspect that I will not touch today too much at all is the attribution of extremes to climate change. So there is a huge body of literature, a growing body of literature that is strongly related to the problem of uh, uh, creating um, suitable and adaptable insurance, insurance tools that tries to say, uh, of course, you cannot attribute an individual event, an individual heat wave, an individual tropical cyclone to climate change, which describes the change in the statistical properties. But some colleagues have been trying to propose a probabilistic attribution. That is, how does change the fact that climate is changing, how, how the fact that the climate, uh, uh, the fact that the climate is changing, altering, the probability of occurrence of a certain event. So by looking at the change in the probability, you can attribute the, the individual event partially to the fact that you have climate change. So now people are making maps of individual events and trying to classify them in terms of how more likely they have become in, in events of that sort as a result of climate change. Now, let me mention, let me go now 
to two specific high impact events that affected Eurasia. So in 2010, we have been a bit unlucky. And in summer, there was a devastating heat wave that impacted Russia. This led to huge, to catastrophic uh, damages in terms of uh, uh, forest fires, drought, uh, devastation of uh, agricultural products and crops, and uh, death toll, uh, and, uh, a death toll of uh, more than 50,000 people. So in, in the same year, earlier in the same year, there was a, what is called, a, what is traditionally called a Mongolian Sud. So the Sud is a recurrent, rare but recurrent phenomenon in Eurasia, in Eurasia that leads to a very long persistent cold spell that, as you can see, spans basically the entire continent. These events have had a, uh, have a, a devastating impacts on the people living in the in the, um, in, uh, in the central and eastern Siberia. And historically, these events have been the drivers of migrations of nomadic people from the steppes of Mongolia towards either enormous impact of the development of civilization in Eurasia. So this, uh, what I want you to note is that these events have been extremely intense in terms of uh, perturbations of the temperature. So here I'm talking about uh, for the uh, Russian heat wave, one month with average temperature order of 10 degrees above average. And in the case of the Mongolian suit, month with average temperature uh, that in a vast range of the continent were 10 or degrees or, or more below the average. Okay. And the question is, these events are of course, uh, have, have been have had devastating impacts. Are they exceptional? Are they freak event? In which sense? So now another event that's closer to your everyday life. So this was the 2019 cold spell that impacted North America. And in fact, one of the very central region of the cold spell was exactly the city of Calgary, which is indicated with the, the green dot. So today, as a, a result of my conversation with Bat Tang, we, together with my team, uh, we have done some work on this event, in fact, just for you guys, Babco, and I will, uh, we have found some very interesting scientific results that I will share with you, and hopefully you will find interesting. So now, this is uh, probably one of the few slides with some equations. Uh, don't be afraid. Equations don't bite unless they bite. But what is the meaning of this? So uh, I just want to tell you the following, that in order to better understand these extremes, if this is extreme event, one needs to follow some sort of systematic procedure as opposed to the intuitive one I was describing before. So there are two natural ways, in fact, to describe extreme events, which lead, in fact, to very important mathematical findings. One, let's look at the right hand side, is the method of block maxima. So assume I have a time long time series, and then I, 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 I divide this long time series into blocks, and then I choose for each block the largest one, and then I study the statistics of these blocks, say annual maxima or annual minima of temperature. The other approach, so-called peaks over threshold, is let's define a threshold and let's put together all the events above a threshold. So as an example, I want to count all the days where the temperature was above 30 degrees or below minus 20 degrees. OK, so if I follow this procedure, which is in fact quite intuitive as well, and I play my mathematical cards in the right way, I discover that I and I, I can say there are powerful theorems saying that by selecting events in this way, I have I end up into what are called universality classes. So so I, I have universal laws describing the statistics of extremes when they are defined in this way. And uh, as Wilson Wolf will tell you, probably, if I've got universality, I can solve problems. What does it mean that I can solve problems? Let's follow Mr. Wolf here. So let's, I, I wanna show you an example of an application in a, in a, that was a PhD project of a student of mine. She studied she wanted to study extreme uh, temperatures in the southern Pakistan in Sindh. So this is not the region where you, we have the best 
time series, the most accurate recordings, still the approach that I, I descri am describing you allow us to have predictive power. What do I mean by predictive power? I mean that by taking, by looking at the uh, time series of temperature in this region and using the mathematical approach I described uh, before, one is able to derive estimate of the return levels of temperature or heat stress, which is a combination of temperature and humidity, which is very relevant for human welfare or for cattle, in fact, or for also crops. So the idea is if you by ending, if you are able to put your data into a mathematical class of universality, you are able to assess the probability of occurrence of yet unobserved events. So of events larger than those you have already observed. And you are able to derive estimates on the uncertainties of your prediction. So this is what is meant by uh, a predictive capability in a statistical sense. I am able to extract information that goes beyond what I have already seen. data to get even by mathematics to create new information that allows me to tell what is the probability of occurrence of a, a, a of a temperature in this case say of uh, uh, over 40 degrees in Karachi and I am able to tell you the return time for this okay and I am able to estimate the the, the uncertainty in this so this as you understand is a very important uh, implication in terms of as, uh, of evaluating risk for this specific event. There is another way you can use this information. As an example, you can train the data on a certain period, assess what is uh, on the training period, the probability of observing an extreme in the way I have described, and then you can look how this apply in a test window. So, and then if in the test window, you have a number of extreme that is uh, much larger or much lower than the one your uh, uh, train reference period tells, uh, you can claim that climate has changed. And this has implication in terms of products that want to evaluate changing risk due to climate change. And these are objects that can be implemented for the insurance business. Not, uh, we, it's long time we talk about weather derivatives, now it's time to talk about climate derivatives. So this is uh, a book that was the result of a lot of work I've done with my collaborators, some of which have been mentioned in the introduction, and uh, where we try to draw a line between occurrence of events and the dynamics and, and, the, and the fundamental properties of the systems that generates such event. And what we had in mind, even if this is a book of mathematics, what we had in mind was trying to understand how the climate works. So now the question I have, I have a question for the audience. And uh, since I cannot have a, an interaction, I will just pose the question, what's the highest air temperature a human body can sustain without dying? Now I will make a pause of 20 seconds and leave you time to think about this. OK, so many people will tell will think it's maybe 60 degrees or 55 degrees or maybe 45 degrees if you don't don't like hot weather. But in fact, you everyone who has been to any sauna knows that you can easily stay in an environment that uh, where the temperature is order of 100 degrees and is perfectly safe. In Finland, where I got my PhD, even people are over 90 do this regularly. And they, there is uh, this is actually considered to be very healthy. So what's the problem here? It's not just the temperature, but it is how long you stay in that environment because you cannot stay more than, say, 15, 20 minutes in a very hot sauna, as everyone who has experienced it knows. Now, what we understand is now from this, what we gather from this is that the impact of an extreme event is not, is not just related 
to how strong it is, but to how persistent it is. So the persistence of an extreme event is an essential ingredient. So I like a lot this tragic figure on the right hand side. Um, so the left hand side describes the anomaly of temperature observed in France in 2003. This was a devastating heat wave that killed literally uh, tens and tens of thousands of people. But uh, the figure on the right, which is the basically gives the epidemiology of this uh, uh, um, heat wave is extremely interesting. On the, uh, what one observes is that during the heat wave, uh, of course, you had excess deaths, but the number of excess deaths increased with time, even if the temperature anomaly was the same. What was happening is that the population the, was getting uh, uh, the impact of the heat wave was becoming harder and harder as time progressed. So it is, if you see that there is a linear increase in the number of daily deaths, means anyone who has done a bit of calculus knows, there's been a quadratic increase of number of deaths with time. So you see that persistence, the length of the heat wave, is not more important. So now here again, mathematics. Uh, provides us some useful tool. So as I told you, I have a, some uh, universal laws to describe the occurrence, the probability of occurrence of extremely hot or extremely cold days. But things are different if I want to study extremely long and persistent events uh, of uh, positive anomaly of temperature, let's call them heat waves, or negative anomalies of temperature, let's call them cold spells. So is there a way to deal with this? And the answer is yes. So the, there is a mathematics that allows us to describe persistent events, but persistent events have another important aspect. Persistent events are also extremely extended spatially. So this is a fundamental property of the atmosphere and of the climate system in general, that the more you look at a persistent event, the more this event will be, the larger this event will be, spatially speaking. So the intense heat wave that hit Russia in 2010 was caused, didn't just happen randomly, was caused by the presence of what is called an omega block. So this is a special atmospheric configuration that leads Local, the, that led to anomalously high temperature and basically absence of clouds, it was a huge high pressure over a, all, uh, all European Russia and Central Siberia. And this pattern persisted for a month or more. But at the same time, this is very interesting, the lack of clouds in Central Russia were accompanied by a strong anomaly of clouds over Afghanistan and Pakistan with the result that in that region you had some of the most devastating floods ever recorded. I mean, without using uh, emphasis uh, or rhetoric, the, this, those were floods of biblical proportions. 20 million people uh, had to flee their house in, in, in the Indus Basin. So you see that extreme events that are persistent have a huge local impact and then they can cascade into other extreme events. So this is important to keep in mind. We go ra rapidly from local to continental to global. So th there is a mathematics, th there is some mathematics that allows us to describe this event and it's called large deviation theory. This is one of the most important theory of probability, probability aspects of probability theory of the 20th century and allows us to find universal laws to describe persistent anomalies with respect to the average. And the key element is that this theory gives us the typical persistent rare events. So not all persistent rare events, the most common among the least common events. So this is a bit counterintuitive, it's the most likely among the extreme events. There will be some strange events that will not obey these statistics, but overwhelmingly this theory will describe the events and we will see in a second why this is important. So now Wall says, wow, 
before I had universality on the sides of an event, but now I have universality on the sides and on the duration of the event, because this large division theory provides me with universal law that allow me to describe not only large events, but events of any duration. So I, I have more universality, I can solve even more difficult problems. And in particular, the more difficult, pro one of the way to see these more difficult problems is that with a relatively small amount of information, I'm able to predict the return level of events that have different intensity and a different duration. So I have learned something new. I have what is called a new degree of freedom, not only the intensity, but the duration. So I can compare the probability of occurrence of an anomaly of five degrees lasting 10 days with an anomaly of three degrees lasting 20 days. And depending on my specific system of interest, the damage might be larger for one or the other. And similarly, of course, of course for cold events. And now we come to the uh, f sort of second and final part of the presentation. So now we want to see if these nice mathematical theories that uh, rely on a lot of as it is. So now we have we will have on one side the observations and the other side the most sophisticated models of the climate we have. In particular, these are so called the Earth system models, uh, which are used in the as an example in the current round of uh, um, let's say coordinated simulation exercise that will lead to that is leading to the current uh, um, uh, most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So these are mod these models are some of the most complex software that exist in the world and they represent all aspects of the climate, the atmosphere, the ocean, the biosphere, the geochemistry and, and so on and so forth. The chemistry of the atmosphere, you name it, it's there. Now, Let's go back to these uh, two events. And these two events, as I said, had huge impact. And where these are one, uh, these, uh, these were extremely rare. So this has been the largest, most intense event of the last century or so. A cold event, as I said, in Eurasia and the, uh, the co in, in Russia, and a, a cold event centered in Central Siberia and Mongolia. So before understanding this event, what we did was verifying the following. Uh, we, 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 we looked at the northern hemisphere and we divided the northern, um, we looked at nine regions of the northern hemisphere and we tried to understand whether these universal laws I had described can be established for the, uh, uh, te the temperature fields inside this region. And, uh, and if these apply, that means that we are able to have some sort of mathematical universality for heat waves and cold spell. And remember, if I have a universality, I have predictive power in a statistical sense. And you know why? Because it, I am able to predict the occurrence of events that are larger or more intense than what I have observed so far. So the result was very interesting. The result is we have univer universality over land, but we don't reach this universality over the ocean. And the reason for that is that the ocean has a long term memory and the presence of a long term memory creates us a lot of troubles. On the other side, with this exercise, and that's something I will not describe today, we have been able to find such universal laws for heat waves and cold spells for present and future climate over all the northern hemisphere, over land, surface and one is able to understand accurately what it means as an example that the risk of heat waves will increase in future climate change. So in the sense there is a way to quantify this in great rigor and we need rigorous quantification to make risk evaluation. This is something I want to stress. It's not enough to say the risk of heat waves will increase. We have to say by how much and in order to do this with a, a proper uncertainty, we need the proper mathematical tools. So we can do, one can do this for heat waves, one can do this for cold spells, and is able to derive this information. But now I will come, I'm going uh, to the end. And the end, uh, hopefully, 
will uh, be the most interesting part. So there is this strange and counterintuitive story that uh, we might make a bit more palatable if we use uh, some ideas. So there are many ways to do ordinary things, okay? But there are only few ways to do exceptional things. Just because they are exceptional, there are not many ways to get there. So what uh, one can find and uh, what the mathematical theories support is that in some sense, when in ext extreme events occur only in few special way. So conditional on the fact that an extreme event has actually occurred, the way it will have occurred will be typical in the sense that the way it manifests itself will look alike. If you look at something very strange, there are not many ways through which such occurrence can take place. OK, and this means that I am then able to investigate like a detective the dynamical mechanism that make this event possible. So this was. Uh, by some colleagues of mine, not by me, who studied rogue waves in the ocean and proved that whereas rogue waves are very rare and of course very dangerous, the way they form is always or almost always the same. So there is universality in the extreme event. So this is obviously sounds cool, okay? So this is uh, 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 Bansky uh, uh, exploiting Tarantino. And of course, our intuition will tell us again uh, that this will never work. Come on, how can you hope to really relate, find universality in something so strange and so uncommon? How can something uncommon to be at the same time typical? But Maya Wallace will tell you, don't be a square. So indeed, going back to this Russian heat wave, we did the following exercise. So on the left, you top left, you have the observation. So these are observations taken on August 2010, monthly average of temperature. This is the same figure I showed you before. Then we try to do the following. We try to run, we had the, our model, a model run without climate change for 1000 years. So this is a model which is, uh, is purely statistical. So this model does not know anything about months, the actual months of the year. It is running in a sort of a perpetual past. Of course, this model will have winter, summer, will have a, a, a lot of the variability of the climate, but as an example, we will not have uh, solar cycles, we will not see, as I said, climate change. And then what we have tried to say has been the following. Now let's select only the months in this ultra long integration of 1000 years, when in Moscow, in the equivalent position as Moscow, we have a positive temperature anomaly of 4.5 degrees, which was the one observed in August 2010. The miraculous thing is that if you do this selection, so I select only the days of the years when for one month in a row, the temperature in that place, specific grid point is 4.5 degrees above normal, and they do the average of all these days. First, there are not many events, just few tens of events like this, because this is indeed a rare event. But if I look at how this, the atmospheric field look like, I find something surprising. I find that not only all these events look similar, but they also look similar to what I have observed in the real world in August 2010. And here is the universality coming out. So I'm learning how this extreme event occurs. And the same thing occurs for the other extreme events I have described you, this Mongolian zone. So there is universality in the way a cold spell like the Mongolian zone takes place and in the way a heat wave like the rush, the one that occurred in 2010 took place. So we have some sort of looking deep into the variability of the climate. But so in some sense, the conclusion is 
these events were in some sort incredibly intense. They were extreme events, but they were not freak events. They were not exceptional. No, they were typical within the class of extreme events. So they were in the right universality. This means that we know how these extreme events take place and we have an understanding of their properties. Let me go now to the another aspect is that you are able to predict the probability of a, recur, of a return of such event. So the moment you are in this, you, you have this universality for free, you have predictive power on the return time of these events. And this is what we want. And then, as I said, we did the same for the 2019 cold spell that hit North America with devastating impacts, especially in Canada and in the US. So this is the temperature anomaly of February 2019, so uh, two years ago, in the region. There is a huge cold blob over uh, basically Alberta and uh, um, Montana and neighboring region, and you have a warm anomaly on the East Coast. Now, this it's well known that this event was caused by a very Then the which is caused, which is one, in fact, a very important, uh, um, let's say, non-trivial aspect of the variability of the. Now, if you if you if you broaden our horizon, and we look again at the anomaly of temperature that we had in February 2019, we see that uh, yes, there was a huge cold anomaly in the western portion of the North America, but there was a very warm anomaly near uh, uh, Bering Strait com with another very strong, look at the numbers, warm anomaly in Western Europe in Northern Siberia. And instead, guess what? There was a cold anomaly, again intense, not ultra intense, in Central Siberia. So we see that when we look at an object that lasts long time, even just locally, because we are only local, looking originally locally in Calgary, this is a global pattern. And uh, we then repeated the experiment that I described you earlier for the Russian heat wave or the Mongolian suit for this event, the event that you guys experienced in Calgary in February 2019. So on the left hand side, you see the observational data that uh, describe that specific year. On the right hand side, you see the result of putting together again the same model as before. So long climate run that doesn't know about climate change, that doesn't know what is uh, which year is this. This is what is called an offline run, an autonomous run. You put together all the events where in that region where there is the green dot, you have a large negative anomaly and you put all these uh, atmospheric fields together and you are able to find something that looks locally, continentally and globally, so much like what we have observed. So what we have observed is a manifestation of a deep internal dynamics of climate. And incredibly, even if we are only sort of playing, uh, trying to fix the temperature in one position, we find not only agreement of the temperature field everywhere, but also agreement in the precipitation anomalies. So we have somehow fixed, found some deep property of the circulation of the atmosphere as a whole. Just by fixing, by uh, trying to reproduce the anomaly of temperature in one location, we find the anomaly of temperature globally and the precipitation globally. So local in space, but with long persistence, Persistence means global in space, OK? And uh, the problem here is that sampling these events is difficult because these events are rare. But there are methods that allow us to go in this direction. So this is where data driven models become useful if they are, of course, used in an intelligent way. So the idea is to try to telescope the dynamics of a model in the direction of trying to reproduce an event that is similar to the one we are interested in too. 
and then using what is called genetic algorithms that uh, select all the trajectory that go in the right direction, one is able to overpopulate this very, very rare world of events like the one of 2019. So I'm coming to the conclusions. My conclusion are, uh, of course, I've been able to provide you just uh, some bit of, bit, uh, uh, and pieces of information about extremes. I try to convince you that this is uh, a very important topic, that despite the fact that these extremes are rare and seemingly erratic, there is something fundamentally universal and so fundamentally predictable about this. And uh, having a quantitative understanding of extremes is essential for evaluating risk in the current climate and even more in the future climate. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio, for this uh, great lecture. Um, very informative and also made me brush on my movie classics, uh, brush up, so uh, very informative on that as well. Um, I think uh, we do have a lot of questions uh, coming in. Uh, just a, an announcement for the audience, uh, we're going to dive into our Q&A session. Mm -hmm. um, a reminder to um, use the question icon, icon to ask questions. It's moderated format, so once the questions are published, you can see them and upvote if you like. We will go in the order of the most popular upvoted questions, and I will do my best to select a broad range of questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's start with the most popular one. We actually have several contenders. Okay. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, from Anonymous. Does increase in weather ex extremes have impact on uh, extreme pandemics? If yes, uh, is that built yes. in the model? Secondly, uh, so that's uh, two questions at once. Does increase yes. in weather extremes have any severe impact on renewable energy production? Oh yeah, sure. The answer is yes. I mean, to both questions. So in the case of, uh, uh, of epidemics, um, uh, the obvious, I mean, example uh, is malaria. Okay, if you have a, a change in the pattern of, um, uh, you know, persistent uh, uh, anomalies in precipitation in tropical regions, this you, you can create uh, um, a local condition that are conducive to malaria outbreak, and not only malaria, dengue, and many other things. So these are major, uh, this has been a strongly, very seriously investigated by many developmental agencies as well as the, by the WHO. So the, uh, this is an area of great uh, interest and study, how cl changing climate condition might lead to uh, co local, uh, to um, sort of uh, uh, conditions that might make the outbreak and the spread of diseases more, um, more common or more easy. Of course, you know, this is for humans, but uh, you have to think uh, uh, for similar problems for, of course, uh, cattle and uh, even uh, uh, in some sense uh, equally dramatically so in terms of uh, pests, vermins and uh, uh, con conditions that can destroy crops and create famine. So this is huge area of work. And of course, the second part, renewable energies, the answer again is, of course, yes, so, I mean, you can think that, uh, as an example, if you have changes in extreme winds, these will impact a lot the production of wind energy because, of course, wind turbines can work only up to a certain cutoff and then they have to stop or they can just be destroyed in some cases. So, wind storms are very damaging, uh, some of the most damaging extreme events, even if they are not as sort of popular as, as floods. On the other side, you can see, uh, think of the opposite extreme. So uh, periods where you have no wind at all. And uh, these, of course, has huge impact there. Uh, and then, of course, changes in the in the changes in the radical changes in the cloud cover might change dramatically the provision of uh, uh, solar energy. And, and let alone the problem that also the sea uh, the CEO was mentioning about the distribution of energy. So that's a still a separate uh, and extremely important aspect. So changes in uh, uh, extreme events can impact a lot any uh, complex and delicate infrastructure and uh, any critical one. So that's, uh, of course, hugely important. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, um, Calgary experienced a major hailstorm on June mm. 13, 2020, fourth most costly national disaster in Canadian history. My God. These, uh, these events seem to be occurring more frequently yes. in the Calgary area when they develop in the foothill region to the west of the city during the hot summer temperatures. Yes. Cloud seeding seem to occur daily in the summer period before the storms hit the Calgary area in the late afternoon. Even though the science has been brought to the forefront with seeding, how can Calgary plan for what's expecting to be more severe weather events uh, in the future? Well, that's uh, in a, you know, no. I mean, I'm I'm surprised. I mean, of course, you you your Calgary is I uh, would uh, not at the center, but well within a continent, and you um, you can experience more and more of these events, and you know you have in summer very strong updrafts that can lead to uh, extreme yet localized, of course, uh, hailstorms. So uh, it's uh, reasonable to expect that with the, uh, in, a, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the future, these events might, these are the typical events that might become, unfortunately, more common and devastating. Uh, uh, these events, have this, uh, they have a very small spatial scale, relatively. It's very hard to them. Of course, it's easy to predict. It's easy. It's possible to predict condu um, whether there are conditions conducive to these events. So you have favorable condition for hail, like you have. Um, just like it's very hard to predict, uh, you know, tornadoes. But it's easy to predict when tornadoes can occur. So these events are a bit easier to predict than tornadoes. But still, uh, they ha uh, happen in a very short time scale. How to how to defend yourself from that? Uh, honestly, it's um, probably becoming uh, just uh, with preparedness, and uh, it's not you cannot uh, escape, you know, a hailstorm if you, uh, you know, if you, 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 you by itself, and you cannot move buildings or move infrastructures or cars. So you have to find uh, other ways, maybe protecting yourself through an insurance uh, uh, tool. That, that's, I think, a uh, right way to proceed. If, uh, interestingly, years ago, a friend of mine who worked for Zurich Insurances, one of the largest provi pro provider of insurances in Europe, in fact, he asked me uh, for a, a info on an insurance product for hailstorm in uh, northeast Italy. That's a big problem, in fact. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, so let me go to the next um, most popular question. Uh, do you believe that the Paris Agreement addresses enough of what is required to help mitigate some of the risks of climate change ahead of us? Also, do you believe governments in general are moving to the correct, uh, in the correct direction and will have enough urgency to reach the agreed targets? Uh, Mille grazie. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, so the no, uh, it's the problem. I, I tell you this. When I was, uh, I, I studied. I used to study. I was a student of condensate matter physics. Then, uh, in the very early 2000, I decided to. I wanted. I decided. Some, I wanted something else, and I wanted to study climate. And in 2001, it was at MIT when there was, you know, the Kyoto Protocol is 1997, and people were discussing. Well, it's good, but it's not sufficient. And uh, uh, there are lots of problems in the implementation and ma making sure countries will respect that. And this problem has been dragging along for 20 years now. So the problem is you have a lot of very complex tools and it's very hard to have countries commit to those because the, it's hard to have some uh, uh, you know, global arbitrate that can pun punish countries and uh, avoid the risk of free riding. This is a really basic problem. Now, um, the, the problem is that we can commit to whatever we want. Uh, it's easy to do, a com uh, you know, to commit if there is no way to, you know, to 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 then pay uh, because you're not go you're not respecting your commitment. So to me, the problem is, of course, the science behind uh, uh, this uh, intention is extremely solid and it's extremely good. And I know many people who contribute to IPCC. I don't personally, but others do. The problem is um, I see that the difficulty is not in the science, 
the difficult, I mean, not that there are a lot of open questions, but the main difficulty is in the implementation, in the in making sure that these uh, uh, that the suitable uh, measures have to be taken. Am I optimistic about that? Uh, honestly, not much, uh, because I, I, you know, we need. Uh, there are two ways, I think, to break this impasse. One way is through some sort of a powerful global governance, but unfortunately. We live in a period where uh, nationalism is very powerful in most countries of the world, and this is a major problem. Uh, and I see, and I say this, uh, you know, politically as well. I, this is my personal. I don't like nationalism. The other way is uh, through a technological innovation and uh, through uh, some market-driven tools. So, if companies, innov innovative companies, uh, maybe like you guys, find a way to optimize your uh, economic welfare technological innovation and environmental protection and win against your competitors on the right side of the history. Uh, there are not, and of course the states have to favor this sort of green champions. Honestly, of course, it's easy. <laughs> the energy sector is the mo is key to this, is key, absolutely key to this. And uh, of course, the energy sector is probably the one of the two or three most important infrastructure in uh, in any sort of developed country, and the definition. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, potential here for both uh, profitable and uh, good business, and for doing something really good. That's my honest take. Thank you. Um, the next question is: uh, Can you apply the same theory to predict the probability of extreme commodity prices, such as electricity price? If well, yes, how uh, far can you predict? Well, there are the the, the methodology is very general. The uh, the the methodology is really very general. One has to test. Uh, um, there are some conditions to apply this, uh, these things. So let me say that in the case of extreme value theory, the two original areas of application are, uh, I mean, like uh, the longest uh, standing one, are hydrology, so something closely related to climate, and the financial sector. So this is really, uh, uh, this is an area of direct application. Uh, so the extreme prices of commodities are investigated with extreme value theory. In the case of large deviation theory, so in the case of persistence, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, what has been done there because it's it's a theory that comes from a different angle and different hypotheses are there. But of course, the idea is, and so I, do, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a very good question. The important thing is if we have, uh, if uh, uh, it is possible to apply this, then we, learn, we, we get some predictive power in terms of evaluating risk. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, the next question is uh, um, from Wittal. Uh, looking at distribution of temperatures across the world during the 2019 Calgary cold spell, mm -hmm. is there a balancing mechanism at play? You already talked, uh, how is climate change impacting the balancing mechanism if it exists? And so I may add, uh, I mean, you, you showed the interesting pattern, right? And, and uh, yes, I think this is also an interesting question. Does the balancing mechanism break up? You know, if uh, if the um, with um, climate change. Yes. So the 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 idea is, uh, oh, you have a large scale when you have a large scale pattern like this. So we like to talk about a planetary wave. You you have to think it's a wave in the sense that assume you associate to blue being a crest and red being a trough or the other way around. So you can see this as some sort of a wave on a plane. So this is why we call it a planetary wave, planetary because it has a planetary scale. So being a wave somehow, uh, uh, you, the idea is you don't have uh, an anomaly that's coherent across all longitudes given a latitude. You have some alternating patterns. These alternating patterns are exactly those associated to these large scale features that I described before in the case of the Russian wave. Now, a heat wave as an example. So in the case of climate change, what is our understanding is that you, these kind of things will, phenomena 
will still take place, uh, but the probability of occurrence. So the, the, the feature in some sense will look similar, but the probability of occurrence of the feature will change. So climate change might uh, uh, be an easier way to understand the impact of climate change in these extreme heat waves or cold spells. It's not that uh, their nature will change, but their probability will change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So next question um, uh, from Anonymous. Uh, uh, it says uh, Bjorn Lomberg, Steve Kunin, Roger Pilkey, Junior mm -hmm. and others have suggested and yeah. presented evidence that extreme weather events in the US have not increased in frequency or severity as the climate change climate has warmed. Do you agree? Well, uh, it's, uh, it, I mean, let, let's put it this way. There are, depends which extreme events. So what is, as an example, I mean, I tell you uh, the, in, uh, it's not, uh, you know, I, uh, I like the, this question in the sense that uh, you, it, it's a, a poking me in the direction of not saying, okay, climate change will change all extreme events. This is uh, not true. So this has been a mistake sometimes by colleagues in climate science trying to attribute everything to climate change and trying a bit to, to dramatize climate change. So there are things climate change is impacting dramatically so in the case of heat waves. Other things uh, less. Uh, in other cases, uh, an important case, uh, which is still in fact to be understood, is the case of tropical cyclones. So as an example, the, for a long time, people thought that it is all more or less automatic that climate change will lead to an increase in the number or intensity of tropical cyclones. And instead, this is not as simple as it sounds. So that's one of those cases where our intuition or the, or the, 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 the ocean becomes warmer, so this is easy, it's easier to get the tropical cyclones, so they should increase. Well, it's again not really working. There are many other factors in place. So. The, the, for sure, it's the statement all extreme events are increasing. It's it's wrong, it's, but some indeed are, and there are you know plenty of studies on this. So um, I think it's very important that we focus, uh, we, we define specifically what is the problem at, at hand and where. Again, there is not an obvious you know coherent spatial patterns. Okay, so in some regions you might have the signal might be much stronger than in other regions as an example. Thank you. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, this is not uh, one of the highest uh, uh, voted questions, but I think it, it uh, feeds naturally to what mm -hmm. you just said, so yes. I will jump it out of order. Yes, sure. Yes, uh, of course. We tend to associate our, our winter conditions to the effects of El Nino or La Nina. Mm -hmm. Would that fit with your work? And, and I think it's uh, um, it fits very nicely with the, your answer yeah, to the yeah. previous question. Yeah, yes, no, in, in the sense that you, what has been, um, this is a very important area of work. Uh, the fact is you have that uh, in some cases, so El Niño La Niña, for those who are not aware, are basically uh, a strongly anomalous condition of the temperatures in the tropical Pacific. And uh, these are phenomena that have a time scale of uh, several years, let's say four years. And they lead, even if it's in principle localized in the tropical Pacific, uh, the El Nino uh, uh, impacts uh, basically the climate all around the world in many very non-trivial ways. So different regions are impacted differently by El Nino. Uh, one of the things is that the El Nino condition make, as an example, the presence of uh, 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 large scale atmospheric waves, so these planetary waves, more or less likely, more or less intense. So changes, so the, uh, the weather, when we are in El Nino, La Nina condition, the probability of occurrence of these events do change dramatically, okay? I want to add uh, a, a, an important thing is that uh, the understanding of uh, the, uh, tro the, of the, the, the fact that uh, what, uh, what are now called the teleconnections, the fact that we have a global pattern of coherent anomalies all around the world came from the investigation of El Nino, La Nina phenomena at the end of the, 20, of the 19th century. Okay, so this has been in some sense, the starting point of our understanding of the global connectedness of the, of the climate system. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next question is very interesting. Um, uh, when do um, extreme cases become common? When should we change return periods to account for increasing extreme events? And if I may add also, um, mm. is there a hope for us um, that we will see more of less extreme events, if I should say, yes. than extreme, extreme events? So, for example, you know, a 30 degree spell in Calgary every every year rather than 40 degrees long spell every third year. No, no, I understand. So the, 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 these are, you know, these are sort of more difficult question to answer because, uh, you know, that means going into the detail of the distribution. What uh, what will change is that uh, uh, with climate change, certain events will just not never take place anymore, basically, or with very negligible probability. OK, uh, in the sense that as an example, you 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 can expect that, um, you know, with time, the probability of ultra low temperatures will become less and less likely, but you can still get to those events. This is very important. OK, so it, it, it's uh, this is a, a bit counterintuitive. The event can take place, but it becomes very unlikely, as an example, very unlikely. So in the, and this is a poses a problem to a per, to someone who has to, you know, Structure. If you are prepared for the worst, you still need to consider the possibility of occurrence of this. Okay, but certain events instead will surely become more extreme and more likely. And as an example, for sure, in the region, in the continental region, the heat waves will become much, much, more, much stronger. This is where you have the there is a combined effect of strengthening heat waves and conditions where you have a drying of the soil which in turn make uh, heat waves easier and more uh, last, long, la longer lasting. Uh, thank you. And this is actually um, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, answers the question I was going to ask next <laughs> from uh, Anonymous. I, I read uh, the question um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so maybe, um, and you mostly answered that, uh, but uh, um, so people know that this question was asked. Thank you. Um, this is very interesting. Thank you. Does this mean that extreme events related to warmer climate, hurricanes and heat waves will become more common both in frequency and duration? Yeah. And extreme events on the colder side of normal will be more frequent due to factors such as warmer air forcing the polar vortex. Will this uh, cold this, yeah. less extreme in duration? Uh, yeah, these are these are. I mean, in the first case, it's it's more or less uh, um, trivial that you're gonna have. Uh, uh, I mean, so somehow you know. Of course, it depends how you define the extreme heat wave. So if you refer to a sort of an absolute uh, um, reference, so above 30 degrees, or if if you're gonna to, uh, refer to a moving reference, so um, I don't know five degrees more than the average of the last 20 years. So the answer might be different in the two cases because uh, with respect to a fixed reference, for sure they become more frequent just because the mean will shift. And uh, in the case, in the other case, it's it's less trivial because it will depend on the change in the dynamics. So these are actually the ways we try to disentangle different F contribution to changes in the extremes. So in the case of cold uh, spells, there is this uh, big question mark related to the fact that while the average will definitely go up, uh, some dynamical features, some unexpected dynamical event might become uh, stay as frequent or become even more intense. So overcompensating. So that means in that case that the tails will stretch. And in which case you might still get, as I was mentioning, some very, very cold spell, but maybe rarely. OK. Uh, and or uh, the, the the persistence of these heat waves might change. But these are again um, really subject of very of current investigation and often we don't have a conclusive answer because these uh, special phenomena that lead to these uh, uh, cold spells are, I wouldn't say poorly understood, but definitely they are non trivial things. So they're not, it's not trivial to represent them as an example with models. Wow, interesting, thank you. 
So I will ask you a tough question, but we don't go ask ahead. easy questions here. So yeah, no, no, go, uh, go, go. Uh, from anonymous, uh, as the world is moving towards sustainable means for energy and fossil fuels, Awfully, uh, yeah. for energy and fossil fuels are depleting. So in the near future, can we expect global warming and extreme weather problems to be solved? Aha, uh -huh. that's uh, that. The problem is, of course, uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, the collapse of the civilization in the sense that, you know, in the sense that if we uh, if if we stop nowadays the consumption of uh, 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 the consumption, uh, uh, we uh, of course we start to slow down and then reverse climate change because the climate uh, naturally uh, reabsorbs uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through a variety of means, greening via forest uh, absorption in the ocean and so on. But the problem is not uh, uh, is to find the path. To, uh, lim uh, to limit as much as possible and hopefully within our lifetime start to reverse climate change by doing uh, a shift in our technology and in our, I need to say, of course, consumption habits, because uh, this is an illusion to believe that things will, uh, uh, will uh, uh, you know, automatically uh, uh, cure themselves if we don't learn to use resources and not just uh, fossil fuel differently and this has to do with changing our priorities, you know, and what makes us happy, what makes us, uh, uh, you know, successful and uh, citizens. So this is a. Um, what I want to say, and uh, as I think it goes back to the very first thing, is that uh, when we think about uh, climate change, we are thinking about the systemic uh, issue with our world. And it asks us, it's, it's a question asking for, uh, if not an answer, at least uh, for some uh, um, thoughts. So it's asking us to think uh, what are our priorities in developing uh, a society. So I don't think climate change can be sorted without changing ourselves, without being more equitable. And uh, it, the technolo there is no technological silver bullet. There is, uh, but uh, of course, uh, technology is essential. OK, but it's not sufficient. OK, it's necessary, but not sufficient to solve the problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there is a, a question about um, tornadoes in Calgary, uh, the changing condition making them more likely. And I think yes. you touched on that yes. a little bit. It, it's, yeah, it's like hail. Yes, it's I mean, uh, yeah. tornadoes are uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on in uh, in a sort of mesoscale. Uh, uh, meteorology, but when you talk about uh, very intense uh, thunderstorms, some of those under certain conditions can lead uh, to tornadoes. So, so the two things are closely related. I think that almost invariably tornadoes are accompanied by hail, in fact. Thank you. Um, next question, geological events like volcanic eruptions and underwater landslides, add to, uh, do they add to extreme weather events? The, well, the landslides are usually uh, one of the events in cascade to intense precipitation and in a very non-trivial way because you can get landslide as a result of accumulated precipitation where the water goes down the soil and changes the mechanics of the soil. And of course, landslides are some of the most devastating um, uh, natural hazard we can think of. I mean, uh, they cause uh, many, many deaths uh, every year all around the world. Uh, so yes, of course, uh, the change, uh, but the change in landslide risk is comes from a combination of few things. So changing the precipitation and the change in the soil use. So that's something very important. We should not forget that it's not just climate uh, thing. So the change in the way we use the soil and we maintain and uh, manage the soil is just is very important as well. So if we if we uh, if we remove, uh, as an example, forest cover, we increase the risk of things like landslides, of course. So the uh, if we increase uh, too much the amount of uh, land that is covered by concrete, so this increases the risk instead of floods. So there is uh, there is uh, you know again uh, the the managing extreme events is uh, requires a complex uh, a complex uh, sort of uh, way of thinking about the problem. Ex uh, the extreme meteoclimatic events are just one piece, an important piece of the puzzle, not all of it. In the case of volcanic eruption, that's a, they have a very strong impact as with the climate as a whole, 
uh, but of course, you know, they have can have devastating impacts locally, but they would not put them under the same sort of category as weather and climate risk because they are essentially geological. Uh, uh, um, so they are still geohazards, but they are, they are of a different nature. Thank you. Um, so there's uh, just a couple more questions. Um, uh, so first one is, um, uh, what uh, level of granularity do you feel comfortable with? Topography and great variability in uh, in it cause major challenges using broad models. It's, this question is from Catherine. Yes, yes, it's a very important question. So this is a this is a huge issue in uh, in uh, in, uh, in climate modeling in general. So the idea is that you have a limited amount of resources and limited ability to represent any way process uh, with a certain detail. On the other side, the world has, uh, uh, of course, uh, features on all scales up to micrometric ones. So how do you bridge the gaps? So the sort of simple minded way is just to try to have higher and higher resolution, but this is just never going to be enough. So in order to bridge the gap between the small time, small spatial and temporal scales and those we can resolve explicitly with the climate models or weather models. In fact, we need to resort to so-called parametrizations. So this is a, a approximate representation of the impact of small scale features or larger scale one. And there is an entire science as well as art uh, in doing this. This is at the very General and in particular of the atmosphere and the ocean and of the climate. And let me tell you that this is also a very important aspect of complexity science in general with deep implication for statistical mechanics. This is one of the area I work on. So connecting the micro with the, with the macro is the great challenge of science in general because we never have access on the micro. We have to bridge the gap and in the case of climate model, this requires a lot of work and it's a very important uh, frontier of research. Thank you. Um, so let's and do sorry, it. just just uh, uh, just uh, the, because the question is uh, when are you happy with the granularity? The answer is depends on the time scale you are interested in. Too. So as an example, if your goal is to have a model that is able to help managing an airport, you need a model with very high spatial resolution because you want to be able hopefully to produce to predict the downdraft, very dangerous uh, uh, weather phenomena near airport. They can kill, they can just destroy a plane. If you're interested in predicting how the weather will be in a large uh, flatland, uh, say in the northern US, southern Canada, because you're interested in uh, uh, corn, in you know temperature and humidity for corn, you don't need the same resolution, OK? So um, it is also object oriented, goal oriented. Thank you. Um, well, we have the questions still coming in. Unfortunately, we uh, only have five minutes left, so uh, let us do um, just uh, one or two more questions. Yes, and, uh, please. And then uh, they will. I published uh, most of them as a moderator, so they're available for record and uh, Professor Lucarini can uh, answer them later at, at his le leisure uh, afterwards. If um, um, sure. uh, if um, uh, uh, if uh, we um, um, if we continue with that. So anyway, um, the first question is: uh, Does the sun not play a role in global average temperature? I have read that there is a very few sunspots right now, which usually have been attributed to cooler temperatures. Is the study of the sun in the model? you use for predicting climate change. Yes, yes, the, the, the variability of the sun is included in the state of the art climate model. So the sun has an influence. It's uh, the sun has an influence. The sun has a very important influence, of course, on ultra long time scales. The thing is, uh, uh, this is usually a sort of a fake uh, paradox, uh, a false paradox. So the sun has an influence, has an influence on all time scale, and its influence is extremely important when we look at uh, longer time scales like in the direction of ice ages. So here we are talking about then we are talking about phenomena occurring on the scale of tens or hundreds of thousands of years. The thing is you, we can think in those terms the impact of climate change. Our impact has been our impact on the global environment is so large 
that uh, it is much larger than the impact of var variability of the sun as, as, as for the last 100 years. So this is, we are strongly overshadowing the impact of solar variability by our action that lead to change in the composition of the atmosphere and uh, in the composition of the soil. So that's the thing. So the sun is there, but we are somehow having a stronger influence. We as humans now. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then uh, I would like to uh, maybe end with uh, uh, optimistic uh, and on sure. an optimistic note, right? Uh, um, is there a lot of inertia in climate systems? If we were to suddenly reach all of our emissions and climate change correction goals, how quickly would the global yeah. climate to react to the reduced oh, input? This is, this is a very, this is actually an extremely intelligent question and subject of oh, investigations by many colleagues. It is sort of forefront of the <laughs> research. It's, uh, the, of course, the answer is, uh, is often depends on what you're looking at, but uh, the, the, the time scale, the, 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 the climate has an inertia. And uh, uh, so the idea is, even if assume now we stop the concentration to the current level, the temperature will continue to increase for a while. The, uh, the trade-off between, say, reducing the concentration, so not uh, reducing the increase in the concentration or halting the concentration, uh, how the interplay between the reduction, rapid reduction of concentration and uh, response in terms of temperature anomaly, it's non-trivial. And it's probably, if we wanted to stop climate change, we would need uh, an extremely rapid reduction of uh, emission. In fact, that's the problem with the Paris target, that in order to achieve those targets, we would need an almost instantaneous and rapid reduction of emission that I find hard to believe. I would love to believe that. And uh, so that's the problem. And I want to stress on this optimistic note because it's important. The risk of setting a very strict target is to create a bias, a psychological bias by which since then if they are look almost unattainable, the response is just doing nothing. This is a very typical psychological reaction of humans. To when you know when things seem too difficult and they seem no way out, so one tries to you know one is just assume assumes there is no way out, so there is no point to doing any effort. So this is why being very sort of strict in the targets can be counterproductive. Which politician and which individual will sell uh, you know will be able to accept great sacrifices, knowing that the risk uh, that they're not going to do much anyway. So this is not, that's not the way to do it. So we have, I think, uh, to, mm, and the, so the question is extremely important. Since the answer is, uh, it's hard to stop climate change, we have to think of ways uh, that make sense to, to uh, reduce the change and then turn it around. Uh, thank you. Um, well, and um, let's, this be the last question. Thank you, Valerio. Okay. For thank you. Um, for remarks and answers, thank you to the ATCO colleagues who have put this event together, everybody who participated, um, and also Nancy Southern who has joined us for the introduction. To all of you who have joined, we very much appreciate your interest and invite you to uh, watch your social media for feeds for information about future speaker sessions. Uh, in the meantime, please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.